All right. So tonight we're going to be talking all about fossils, which is uh, probably one of our, our more frequently reoccurring themes or subjects in this series is fossils. One of the subjects that you probably hear coming up more, more, most frequently in an apologetic series like this, fossils, due to the reason that uh, fossils, arguably, fossils stand as the as the main body of evidence that lies between the big debate between creation versus evolution, between the age of the earth, natural history and biblical history, the main body of evidence that seems to lie between these two views, the main body of evidence that is debated between these two views is the fossil record, or our fossils. And so if you do not understand fossils, how fossils were formed, how they fit into earth history, then you do not understand earth history. Then you have a terribly flawed worldview. You have a terribly incorrect view of the world if you do not understand the correct history of fossils, the correct interpretation of fossils. But um, if what all you know is the interpretation of fossils that has been taught by natural science, then you have a terribly flawed worldview. And we're going to do our best to correct that for you this evening. All right? Well, we all know what fossils are. Um, Fossils uh, are traces of pre-existing life that are embedded or preserved in the rock, rock record. Um, hard things like uh, seashells, like clamshells and wood fossilize fairly readily. Um, some things become mineralized when they're fo in fossil forms. Other things are just impressions. But these are um, traces of pre-existing life preserved in the rock record. <clears throat> the reason why we call it a fossil record is that these fossils, like these sea seashells and petrified wood, are found in layers of rocks, layers of rocks that have recorded a sequence of events. So there is a recording there that is found in fossil form. <clears throat> I mean, just like we, uh, that we read tree rings to decipher the history of a tree, or we can take ice cores and read the history of ice formation up in the Arctic. We can read these layers of rocks that fossils are found in and... Uh, interpret, if we will, the history of the world. Well, natural science interprets these layers of fossil-bearing rock, these layers of rocks, as having formed slowly and gradually over long periods of time during different epochs of time, during epochs or epochs of time. The different layers that you see there, for example, in the Grand Canyon are argued to have formed during different uh, geologic periods, during different depositional environments. So the earth maybe at one point was a desert, and a, and a desert layer formed, and then, it, and then the ocean inundated, and you had a marine deposit form on top of that, and then it was a swamp, and you had shale formed on top of that. They believe these different layers of rocks formed as the earth's environment changed dramatically over time, leading to different types of deposits being laid and different types of rocks being formed. This is their interpretation. Well, this interpretation of fossiliferous layers of rock stands at today as the, their main observational evidence for the theory of evolution. Because it has been observed that fossils typically exist in certain layers. They're, the fossils are sorted, if you will. There are some fossils typically found below or above other kinds of fossils. And this is interpreted by natural science to have recorded a history of life on Earth over hundreds of millions of years, and the evolution of organisms from simple to complex forms. This is how they interpret it. This is, stands today as their main observational evidence for the theory of evolution, that life on Earth has changed over time. See, they, they look at these different layers. There's different plants and animals in this layer than the one or above it, and there's different plants and animals in the one above it. Look, life on Earth has changed over time. There you go, evolution in, rock, in the rock record, they would argue. However... These, the fossils that we find are not truly set in stone. Fossils are often, oftentimes found out of place, often by millions of years. The fossil record described by paleontologists is really better understood as a statement of evolutionary thinking or a model of how they believe fossils should be. So when you see diagrams like this, understand that those diagrams are, real, are really a representation of how they believe fossils should be, not how they always are. Well, these teachings of evolution can have a terrible impact on, on people of faith. I believe that the teachings of natural science is the single biggest impediment 
against people coming to the faith and can lead to a loss of faith, and particularly amongst young people who have been indoctrinated into this natural history of the world. Jesus, uh, <clears throat> Jesus said, in, I believe, uh, was this in a response to Nicodemus? He says, I've spoken to you of earthly things that you do not believe. How then will you believe I speak of heavenly things? The point is, if we can't trust what the Bible says on earthly matters, on historical matters, like those, the history that was con contained in the Old Testament, how can we trust what it says about spiritual matters like salvation? We have to remember that the Old Testament and New Testament are part of the same book. If we can't trust what it says in the Old Testament about ancient earth history, how can we trust what it says in the New Testament about salvation? If we can't believe the miracles in the Old Testament, how are we going to believe that ultimate miracle in the New Testament when Jesus was raised from the dead? Well, Prentice Hall Biology is one of the most widely used biology textbooks used in public schools today, and they summarize the use of fossils in support of evolution this way. They say, by Darwin's time, scientists knew that fossils were the remains of ancient life and that different layers of rocks had been formed at different times during Earth history. Darwin saw fossils as a record of the history of life on Earth. Darwin, like Charles Lyell, proposed that the Earth was many millions rather than thousands of years old. Why do you think Prentice Hall Biology inserted that in there? Millions rather than thousands of years old. Well, the reason is that most people know that the Bible, if interpreted in, in its most straightforward manner, argues that the earth is very young in, on the order of just like 6,000 years old. They continue, during this long time, this millions of years, they say, Darwin proposed that countless species had come into being, lived for a time, and then vanished. So by comparing fossils from older rock layers or the deeper layers with fossils from the younger layers or, or those that are above them, scientists could document the fact that life on Earth has changed over time. This is their interpretation of fossils. But there is another interpretation. Well, these rocks, um, the ones that bear fossils, you should know, are not new rocks. Are, are, I mean, these are new rocks. These, are, these rocks that you see fossils in, these layers of rocks, were formed when older rocks, basement rocks, like granites, weathered away, those particles, particulates, were transported. When they're transported, we call them sediments, transported by the actions of fluids, uh, and they transported to new area and then deposited. And then they can harden and, into a rock. So all of the, the rocks that you see there were, are new rocks. The rocks that fossils are found in are new rocks. Well, the fact that water is one of the causes or frequent actions that transports these sediments and deposited them causes us to want to assume that these layers of fossiliferous rock and the fossils, the dead plants and animals that are contained within them, were formed during the biblical global flood. And in fact, this has been historically assumed. All the way back in antiquity, when people saw fossils, People in, that were in the Bible-believing world, when people saw fossils, they automatically assumed that what these were were the plants and animals that were destroyed during the flood of Noah. It was automatically assumed. Let's read a little bit of the text. Genesis 6 describes the flood brought, brought by God, of course, due to the evil that was on the earth in those days. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts, the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he, had made human, that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I, I, that statement that he regretted making humans, that's a terrible statement. But that's how wicked they were, and how wicked in reality we are, you know? So God told Noah he was going to destroy the earth by flood, instructed him how to build the ark, and sent the animals to Noah to be kept alive. It specifically says that. The animals will come to you to be kept alive. God sent the animals specifically to Noah. The perfect animals, the perfect pairs were sent to Noah to repopulate the earth. Well, one other point that we need to make is that the flood of Noah was clearly a global scale event. There's no way to interpret the text differently, although everyone tries. Again, every Christian, every Christian, I'll say this, every Christian that accepts evolution, believes in evolution, and believes in the ancient age of the earth, as is put, taught today by natural science, is rejecting the flood as being a global scale event. All of them. 
they either believe it was a, just a local event or a non-event. Either Some believe it's just a non-event. It didn't ever happen. But you cannot get a local event out of this description. And unless you want to completely deny biblical history, you're not going to ever get it, it to be a non-event. This is what it says. The waters prevailed so mightily upon the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heavens were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. That's like 22 feet. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land whose nostrils the breath of life died. It says, all the high mountains hold heaven recovered. Everything on dry land whose nostrils of the breath of life died. These are all-inclusive statements. This is a global flood. It covered all the mountains. There's no way to get a local flood, a local event, out of something that covered the mountains so significantly as this, as this did. Well, assuming that there was, that the flood described in, in Genesis was a real and historical event, and I believe it was, then one thing is absolutely clear. The geology of this event has been misinterpreted by natural science. It's been misinterpreted. I mean, what else would we expect to find? Had there been a flood like the one described in the Bible, then what we actually find? And people in antiquity didn't know about these vast geologic layers that blanket the globe. I mean, what would we expect to find? We live on top of a flood wasteland. I took this picture a few, a few years ago now when I went down to Texas on my way through the, uh, I, I stopped at Canyonlands National Park and took this picture. But you see these kind of sediments everywhere where, where the ground is exposed, you find sedimentary rocks like this that, that have fossils in them. We live on top of flood wasteland. That's what all of that material is. It's flood deposits. Well, if, if we interpret the fossil record from within the biblical worldview, then the sorting that we see in the fossil record, again, the sorting that you see over here in this diagram with different fossils found in different layers, right? If we interpret this sorting, if we interpret the fossil record consistent with the biblical history and assume that if the global flood was responsible, then what, what ultimately we're really looking at here is just these layers are just the destruction of successive habitats, okay? Remember, the flood was a prolonged event. Uh, it took 150 days, 150 days from the 17th day of the second month of Noah's life to the 17th day of the seventh month of Noah's life, 150 days for the water to crest the tops of the mountains and for ultimately everything to die. Five, five months, 150 days. Waters rose slowly upon the earth as uh, it rained and the uh, fountains of the great deep burst forth, right? Well, what happened is that as the water rose, it destroyed one habitat and then another on top of it and another on top of it. The earth, you understand, is made up of a bunch of different kinds of habitats. We call these habitat biomes, like there's grasslands and then you got coniferous forests and you got alpine meadows and your wetlands and everything. Well, the difference between one biome and another are two main, what we call abiotic factors, and they are uh, temperature and rainfall. The different biomes, these different types of habitats differ from one another because they have diff there's different temperature and rainfall in those areas, and that causes different plants and animals to live there. Well, temperature and, uh, temperature and rainfall are both directly related to elevation. So as you go up in elevation, you encounter different temperatures and different rainfalls, and in fact, you encounter different habitats, or these types of habitats we call biomes. So when you look at the globe, at the same elevation and temperature you're, uh, and rainfall, you're going to find the same habitats. So as the floodwaters rose, it destroyed one habitat on top of, and then buried the next one on top of it, next one on top of it. That's all you're really looking at. That's all that's really re re responsible for the sorting of fossils. Well, listen to this prophecy from 2 Peter. This is from the NASB, um, which well describes how naturalistic world, the, the, the naturalistic worldview that is influencing the interpretations of geology today. Listen to this. This is, again, from 2 Peter. He says, Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following their own lusts, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the very basis for, uh, of naturalism, of the, natu the philosophy of naturalism as applied to geology, which is what we call uniformitarianism. 
Um, this guy shown here, James Hutton, was uh, an early geologist who argued against the biblical catastrophe. He argued for a view called anti-catastrophic. He was an anti-catastrophist and argued that sedimentary rocks are the result of cyclic processes of erosion and sediment deposition, processes that he argued do not change over time. He summarized this with this famous phrase, no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. Now, look at, that, at this verse again, the one we just read. It says, mockers will come saying, all continues just as it was from the beginning. This is exactly what uniformitarian geology argues, that geologic processes are cyclic and have not changed over time. This is exactly what they argue for. Now, let's read on. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Their view that all continues just as it was from the beginning causes it to, quote, escape their notice, or as the ESV renders it, deliberately overlook this fact that the world was flooded with water. Is it, that's an a very interesting a prophecy and exactly what we're seeing today. Well, the different interpretations of fossils can be summarized this way. The question is, which interpretation does the evidence best support? We're going to look at this. If you interpret the fossils from the evolutionary perspective, they argue that fossils show that organisms evolved over long periods of time and were buried in watery sediments through slow and gradual processes. This is what they argue for. But what the biblical view on fossils would argue that, that they show that organisms appear suddenly and were buried rapidly in the watery sediments during Noah's flood. Again, the question is, which interpretation does the evidence best support? We want to look at this. So we're going to look at, we're going to look at fossils from both points of view, from the point of view that there was a global flood, and we want to examine fossils to see if there is evidence from the fossil record to show that it is the result of a major global-scale catastrophic flood, and then we're going to come back and look to see if the fossil record does have the evidence it should have for evolutionists to claim it supports their view. So we're going to look at, look at it critically from their standpoint as well. Well, I would argue that the fossil record is an enormous body of evidence, powerful body of evidence, proving without a shadow of a doubt that there was a global scale flood like the one described in the Bible. There is truly a monumental body of evidence for the global flood. The earth is covered in flood sediments that are hundreds of feet thick. And in places, these, sediments are, these sedimentary rocks reach kilometers in thickness that are laden with the fossils of dead plants and animals, like the layers you see here in the Grand Canyon. Again, in places, these layers, like we see in the Grand Canyon, reach kilometers of thickness. And these rocks stretch for hundreds of miles, and some can be traced for thousands of miles all the way from one side of the continent to another side of the continent. Now, this is a U.S. geologic survey diagram. This is a diagram produced by one of our national government agencies that, that studies geology, the U.S. Geologic Survey, and it shows how these layers of rocks can be traced from the Grand Canyon all the way over to Utah. Notice on the far right side of the diagram, you can see the Grand Canyon wedge. And those are the layers in the Grand Canyon that can be traced from there all the way, from there all the way across through Utah, through both Zion and Bryce Canyon National Parks. The same layers can be found there. Well, the Tapete Sandstone, one of the layers exposed at the Grand Canyon, that, the one I pointed to there, can in fact be traced almost all the way across North America. Look at this map. Now, this was uh, developed using oil well drilling information, but that is where that same bed of sedimentary rock has been found over North America. Well, when you consider that the Tapete sandstone is a turbidite, a type of sedimentary rock that forms in underwater landslides, what we call turbidity currents, then the evidence that this provides for a continental wide catastrophe is overwhelming. And this type of, of continental-wide coverage by fossil-bearing rocks is the norm. It's not an isolated incident, not isolated there to the Tapete Sandstone. It's the norm for the fossil record. This is another U.S. Geologic Survey diagram map that, uh, that shows how extensive these layers of flood deposits are. They blanket the continent. But uh, 
There's, an, there's another reason why I want to bring this diagram to your attention. What this diagram actually shows is the layers of the fossil record that are on the surface in North America. Next to the map, the color-coded map, I'm going to put the legend that shows the names of the layers, of the, those are the, the layers of the various geologic periods, the geologic eras, right, that you see color-coded. Notice those are the same names as in this diagram that I showed you here. You can see the same names for those geologic periods like Jurassic and, and Cretaceous, and those are those various names of the fossil record, right, the, what we call the geologic column. You see those here also. Okay, so find the colors for those various geologic periods and find where they are in North America. And there's something very important that I want to show you. Look up in Canada where all of those reds, where all that red area is, and then find it down here on the legend. The red areas up there in Canada are believed to be 2 billion years old. And yet, all of the layers that are supposed to be above them are gone. So where is all that, where's the two billion years of geologic history that should be there on top of those red layers? Uh, again, the fossil record, you know, our, the fossil record is not complete almost anywhere you look. They basically have pieced it together by studying a few layers here and then a few more layers here and a few more layers over there and basically pieced together the whole thing. But when you get right down to it, the vast majority of the fossil record is missing from most locations. Well, again, if we, and this, this is their interpretation, but we've got to remember that there is a different interpretation. If we interpret this from the biblical worldview, again, the sorting of fossils is simply due to the successive destruction of those various types of habitats from during the rising waters of the, of the global flood. Now, I want to show you something else, reminding you that those different layers are due to uh, destructions of successive biomes, the different types of habitats, right? So what I'm going to do now is next to this map, I want to put another map up there that is actually a map that shows where the present-day biomes are in North America. Because at some point, that's what this map reminded me of. I had, I had used this map. I mean, back up to the, uh, this other map. I had used this map in, in a talk like this for years. And then at some point, I was using this map, and it reminded me of the biome maps that I show in, when I teach biology. And so I looked one up on Wikipedia, and I found a biome map, and I was like, oh, wow, those look really similar. So again, the map on the left is the layers of the fossil record that are on the surface of North America, which we argue are just is just due to the successive destruction of those biomes, those different habitats. Now look at the map on the right. That's the location of the present-day biomes in North America. And look at how interestingly similar those are. It's really tough for me to point with this, but here you go. Look at this. Look at, for example, that line right there and that line right there. You can see it on this map, right? How closely similar those different biomes are to one another. Because see, in reality, that's all it is. That's all the sorting of fossils is, is the destruction of success, successive habitats. When you get right down to the fossil record, is overwhelmingly powerful evidence for the global flood. Let me show you some more evidence. Another powerful evidence that what you're looking at is due to a global scale flood is the fact that we can find ocean fossils everywhere. And I mean everywhere. You can find them on the top of every mountain chain in the world except for like your volcanic mountains, which have pushed through the sedimentary rock layers. When the mountains that have been uplifted, you can find fossils up there. You go to the tops of the Andes and the Alps, and you can find fossils up there of dead plants and animals, like clams. I mean, when you get right, clams are everywhere. When you get right down to it, you better, to, you could just describe the fossil record as a record of clams, because I mean, clams are building everywhere. But the fact that ocean fossils are on the tops of mountains is not the big deal, okay? Because mountains do, are, can be lifted. And a floodplain, even a, a coastal floodplain, can get lifted up and become the top of a mountain. So the fact that fossils are on the tops of mountains is not the big deal. It, but ocean fossils are everywhere throughout the fossil record. Everywhere. Unlike the idealized diagram of the fossil record, like the one that I show you here, that has mostly land animals, the real fossil record is comprised almost entirely of ocean fossils. 95% of all fossils in the fossil record are marine invertebrates, meaning ocean invertebrates, primarily shellfish. 95% of the remaining 5% are plants. 95% of the rest are fish. Most of the rest are insects. The truth is that much less than 1% 
of the fossils. In the fossil record are land vertebrates. It is clear that the fossil record was formed when the oceans had inundated terrestrial habitats, causing land and marine organisms to be buried together. If we interpret these findings consistent with the Bible, it is clear that this was due to a single extended global scale event, or if it is interpreted within the boundaries of philosophical naturalism or secular geology, then repeated inundations by o oceans would be necessary. You'd have to flood, the, flood it by an ocean once, and then flood it by an ocean, have to come in again to put ocean deposits in the next geologic period, and then ocean fossils would have to come in again to put ocean fossils in the next geologic period. You'd have to have to open over and over and over again. And this is what they argued. They argued that repeated ice ages raised and lowered ocean levels, causing them to repetitively uh, inundate the continents. The problem with this is we don't just find ocean fossils on the outer edges of the continents. We find them all the way across throughout the fossil record. Now, how do you explain an ocean coming in and inundating the land, completely covering the land and going back out and evolution of terrestrial animals continuing? How do they live and continue to evolve? Yeah. Well, recent and rapid catastrophic burial by sediments is also strongly supported by the discovery of fossilized soft tissues. Well, geologists claim that fossilization requires millions of years. Many fossils, though, have now been discovered that still contain preserved soft tissues that simply cannot survive millions of years due to decomposition. Decomposition is the norm, and it is a rapid process. It's the reason why we don't have dead plants and animals laying all over the place out there. They, are, they decompose, and they de they're de broken down by bacteria and fungi and oxidation so that those materials can again be available to the next generation. It has to happen for life to continue. Well, we found fully articulated skeletons like the fish you see here, soft, fleshy parts such as skin, cartilage, unborn fetuses, stomach contents. Well, due to the rapid rate of decomposition, such fossilized soft tissues are clear proof that they were buried rapidly by sediments, not over long time periods. And this is key. Lots of fossils have been found that show almost no sign of normal decomposition. Delicate structures like eyes and soft feathery appendages are preserved in fossil form. Many of them are identical to animals and plants we still have alive today, easily recognizable, often so well preserved that we can identify them by species. Delicate structures like the membranous wings of a dragonfly, their compound eye. We've, in fact, been able to do a significant study of compound eyes from fossil forms, like the trilobite here. Trilobite's an extinct arthropod an extinct uh, ocean creature that had a compound eye, but we were able to study its compound eye because it's, it was so well-preserved in the rock record. And this guy right here was buried by sediments before it had time to even pull in its eye stalks. Because much like snails have these little eyes on these little, they pop in in a second, Couldn't, didn't even have time to pull in its eye stalks before it got buried by sediments. Well, the problem with finding soft fossilized soft, soft tissues, again, like stomach contents and stuff, is that Fossils don't just lay around waiting to be buried by sediments slowly over long time periods for a fossilization to take place. When an animal dies, it's picked apart by scavengers or predators. They, they pick a part of the fleshy part of the, uh, of the animal, or, and then uh, the skeleton is broken apart. Uh, bacteria and fungi come in and make short work of the rest. Again, oxidation uh, decays the whatever's remaining in that material is available, again, as, uh, as topsoil for the next generation. Only rapid and massively catastrophic burial by sediments is sufficient to slow decomposition and allow for fossilization or the mineralization of fossils to take place. For many fossils, it's clear that they were killed by the sedimentary flow that entombed them and allowing them to become a fossil. Understand that to get a fossil, at least a mineralized fossil, you have to have two things. Two things have to happen. One, normal decomposition has to be arrested, slowed so significantly that mineralization is able to take place. So you have to stop decomposition. The, the deeper you bury something, the slower the rate of decomposition. When you're close to the surface, you got a lot of bacteria and fungi and oxidation that can break you down. The deeper you bury something, the fewer animals are down there, the fewer microbes are down there, and decomposition is slowed greatly. And then you have to, so you have to bury something to slow decomposition, and then you have to have water that has a lot of minerals in it. You have to have mineral saturated water that is able to trickle through there as that wood or whatever it is, shell slowly decays. Minerals are replaced 
Our, our minerals are deposited there, replacing the shell or the wood. So when you find a piece of uh, petrified wood, what you in fact have is a rock-like copy of the wood. It's no longer wood, okay? But to get, a, to get a fossil like that, you have to have those two things. You have to slow decomposition, arrest decomposition, and you have to be able to deposit minerals there, water-borne minerals. Both of those things happen in floods. You bury things rapidly in, by sediments during the flood, and you have lots of uh, water with minerals in floods too. Well, <clears throat> once buried, understand sufficiently by sediments, water that is that infused with minerals must be present for that mineralization process to take place and then preserve that bone or petrified, petrified uh, shell or whatever, whatever you have there. But some animals have been found that were literally buried so quickly by sediments that their fossil record, it re records a snapshot of a moment in time. This fish was buried so quickly that it didn't have time to gulp down its meal, becoming the petrified last supper. <laughs> petrified last supper? Yeah, it's supposed to be funny. Mm. <laughs> this ichthyosaur, an extinct marine reptile, was in the process of giving birth when buried by sediments. So its birth was captured. A moment of time was captured there. It was buried by sediments so quickly. Lots of animals thought to have gone extinct 65 million years ago have been discovered with soft tissues, like the hadrosaur skeleton you see here, still intact, meaning fully articulated, plus skin, cartilage, stomach contents, all present. Well, in fact, stomach contents have been found on hadrosaurs that was so well preserved in a number of these uh, extinct animals that paleontologists were able to identify their diets and therefore the habitat where they live. Hadrosaurs, just so you know, were once uh, uh, thought to be semi-aquatic because they have a, what looks like a duckbill. They're like called the duckbill dinosaurs. Not really duckbill, but they, so they were thought to be semi-aquatic, using their duckbill like the waterfowl do to sift through mud or whatnot. But uh, an analysis of stomach, petrified uh, fossilized stomach contents revealed that they forged at much higher elevations. And so this old picture of hadrosaurs is now known to be incorrect. Well, hadrosaur bones have also been found that are not even fossilized or mineralized. This is the toe bone of a hadrosaur that's on display at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. And they invite visitors to come and touch real dinosaur bone. The uh, caption on the reader board reads this. This is real dinosaur bone from the hind foot of a genus of hadrosaur. Although it is 69 million years old, it is still original bone and not rock. Well, I hate to tell you, but bone does not lay around for 69 million years. It decomposes. And even if, uh, you know, this is up in Alaska, so probably pull this out of ice somewhere, but, you know, these things don't lay around for 69 million years. In 2011, a notosaur fossil was discovered by a, uh, a mine heavy equipment, heavy equipment operator in uh, northern Alberta, Canada, that was, uh, it's dated at 110 million years old, but it is so well preserved, it seems to be staring back at you from its really well preserved eye. Can you see its eye right there? This is the hadrosaur. It's said to be one of the, the best preserved hadrosaur, or, excuse me, uh, and this is a, a type of ankylosaur called a, a notosaur. Here's uh, some of the notosaur's uh, plates, the scoots on its back. Now, this was a, a plant-eating dinosaur, but it was packing some serious armor, as you needed to, with the types of predators running around. That's what the, the scoots were for on its back there, uh, called uh, osteoderms. Also had uh, spikes around its neck. You can see some of the spikes that it had around its neck. The longest spike was 20 inches, 20 inches uh, long spike. You can also see, this is just behind its head, to the left side of that picture, you can see skin. That was the skin that was just behind its head. See, well-preserved notos or skin right there. Ribs were preserved. Those are the ribs. Stomach contents were preserved. Not sure what it was eaten, but it was yummy, I'm sure. Well, in 2005, a Tyrannosaurus rex was discovered in the Hell Creek Formation of Montana by North Carolina State University professor Dr. Mary Schweitzer. Well, due to its weight, uh, this was a, a femur that after being wrapped in plaster paris, which is what they do out in the field, they wrap, wrap these fossils in plaster paris to, to carry them out, to, to keep them safe. Well, after wrapping it with plaster paris, the femur weighed 3,000 pounds. 
and they were unable to transport it by helicopter out of the area, which was their plan, so they broke it in half and packed it. Well, when they got the boxes back to her lab, uh, Mary Schweitzer immediately noticed bone tissue, that's called medullary bone, inside of the, the femur, which prompted some uh, further analysis. Um, from the marrow cavity, Schweitzer found soft, flexible tissue that upon treatment could be stretched and would return to its original form. Well, since the T-Rex is believed to have gone extinct 65 million years ago, this was completely unexpected. In her amazement, she found what appeared to be blood vessels with what she believed were red blood cells with nuclei, with a nucleus, uh, similar to the uh, hemoglobin uh, red blood cells possessed by reptiles. Uh, the red blood cells possessed by mammals and birds does not have a nucleus. So this, she could tell that these were reptilian uh, uh, red blood cells. The vessels, the blood vessels, were even revealed to be lined with specialized bone endothelial cells. However, a skeptical scientist uh, initially suggested that uh, the bone endothelial cells were actually just bacterial biofilms. Dead bacteria can aggregate together and form a slime, and that's what they claim these were. But uh, uh, she, Ma Dr. Mary Schweitzer, to her credit, uh, and her co-workers, um, did some additional studies, and they found, uh, for, they found the uh, intact col protein, uh, collagen. They found that, that intact collagen present in this, which is a protein that is made by, uh, by, by, uh, by vertebrates, but is not something that is possessed by or made by bacteria. So their discovery of collagen inside of what they thought were blood vessels proved that these were not bacterial biofilms. In fact, they had actually found um, dinosaur tissue. Well, soft tissue, like uh, stomach contents and skin, have been discovered that date by conventional methods well beyond 100 million years. Over the last decade or two in particular, a huge collection of, fo of fossilized soft tissues has been discovered. And these offer strong proof that these tissues simply are not that old, but were instead buried recently and catastrophically. Fossil graveyards have also been found that contain thousands of animals. Again, another proof that what you're looking at is the result of a major catastrophe. The Dinosaur National Monument, uh, which is uh, one of the exhibits shown here, is located in Colorado, straddling the Utah border and uh, protects a large deposit of dinosaur fossils that belong to at least 11 different kinds of dinosaurs. More than half of all the different kinds of dinosaurs found in North America have been found in this one bone bed. Well, in, entire communities of organisms have been found buried together like this, and yet scientists today seem reluctant to offer the correct explanation for how these occur. When I was a kid, I remember they, had, they discovered a, uh, uh, an elephant graveyard, similar, similar to the dinosaur graveyard. So you had found an elephant graveyard, and the, the explanation we were given for its existence was that was the traditional place where the elephants would go to die. And how ridiculous is that? You know, like when an elephant gets old, well, I'm getting old, my hip feels like it's starting to seize up, maybe I better go wander off to where my mom died and I'll wait there until the rest of the life leaves my body. I guess, you know, it's ridiculous. The explanation that was given for that, just refusing to recognize the obvious interpretation that what that was was a huge herd of elephants that had all died in a, a catastrophic flood. But they are afraid of that explanation, catastrophic flooding, because they've been fighting that for the last 150 years, fighting that biblical view of fossils since the 1850s. Entire communities of organisms have been found buried together in mass in this way, in what we call mass mortality beds or, or, or bone beds or, or uh, mass graveyards. And again, these support the catastrophic nature of these sedimentary flows that preserve these animals and their plants from decomposition and allowing them to become a fossil. And some of these fossils, some of these uh, more, uh, fossil beds have been found that are oriented. For example, look at these nautiloids. These are, now look how big these are. Look at the scale, 10 foot scale. So some of these nautiloids, the shell on some of these nautiloids were alone six feet long. These are massive organisms, right? So what you're talking about, uh, um, you're talking about an underwater flow of sediments here that was very energetic to force all of these nautiloids into the same direction when burying them. Well, a number of fossil beds have also been found that are called log jam beds. 
log jam beds. Now, I often have, I have to explain what log jams are to my uh, students because they don't know what log jams are. I'm assuming most people here know what log jams are, but let me explain anyway. So back in the olden days, before they had, uh, you know, trucks to haul logs and stuff like they do today, they would uh, use the rivers. So they would cut the trees, drag them down into the nearest river and release them in the river. And the uh, timber mills where they cut the logs were, were usually on rivers. Uh, if you go to, uh, what is it, uh, Leavenworth, there's a big, there's a little trail where there was a, 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 a big mill out on the river and it formed an artificial island because of all the, all the timber. Anyway, they would float these down river. Well, what, what would happen every once in a while, uh, one would get hung up on the shore or something and then another one would get hung up behind it and you'd have a log, whole bunch of logs would get jammed up. And man, I've seen pictures of some massive jams, man, and like a dozen people out there trying. So they'd send these guys out there with poles, you know, trying to pry these logs free from one another, get the thing flowing again, okay? Well, we have found fossils that are described as log jam beds that are believed to have formed similarly. According to them, according to paleontologists, what they discovered, they believe, was a bunch of animals that were floating down a river all together, all jumbled up together like a log jam, and then they got hung up someplace and all got buried by sediments. But how does that not sound like a catastrophic event able, that killed all of those animals in a flooding situation, right? It just, it just seems so obvious. Fossils are also found that are termed death pose fossils. Now, the first time I heard this was when I had John Morris, who was the former president for the Institute of Creation Research, uh, do a seminar at the, uh, at the Creation Conference that I organized. And he brought this up and, uh, and d- during his talk on fossils. And so I went and did a little research on this, and sure enough, I found that there's a whole bunch of fossils that are called death pose fossils. And what these are uh, typically are animals with long necks and long tails. The neck, in particular, of animals with long necks will be arched way back. And it appears the interpretation of this is that this was an animal in the throes of a struggle. So probably trapped in mud, probably got stuck, was trying to free himself from what he was stuck, mud he was stuck in, eventually became exhausted and just kind of laid down and, and just uh, was giving it up. But we have found lots and lots and lots of fossils now, these animals with long necks and long tails that are in these death poses. Again, uh, I think speaking to the catastrophic nature of the sediments that they are buried within. Okay. Well, I, I believe there's a monumental body of evidence to show that the fossil record is the result of that terrible catastrophe that was brought by God because of the wickedness on the earth in those days. But again, today, evolutionists argue that fossils are the proof that life on earth has evolved over time, that instead of life being created here by God in all of its glory, with all of these various forms, that uh, it evolved slowly and gradually over long periods of time. Well, again, the fossil record is one of their main evidentiary supports for this. Uh, The other being uh, what they call a a homology. They point to similarities amongst organisms, like look at all the mammals with five fingers and five toes. They must have evolved from a common ancestor with five fingers and five toes. So they point to homology as a proof of evolution. But their main proof is the fossil record, is the fossil record. Again, they look at uh, fossil record and say, look, life on earth has changed over time. There are different fossils of plants and animals in this layer than the one above it. Look, it was different. That, during that period of Earth, things were different than during this period of the Earth. So they, uh, they believe these different beds of rocks are, were formed during different periods of time, completely different periods of time, when the Earth was completely different. However, does that prove evolution? Uh, it, is the fact that there's different plants and animals in one layer than it is in another layer, does that, is that proof of evolution? Well, no. What they, in fact, must be able to show by way of the fossil record is an organism in the process of evolving. Can they show this? Well, this this is the problem. I mean, the fossil record should be filled with fossils that we call intermediates or transitional forms. Should be filled with these. But is it? Now, at the time Darwin published his book On the Origin of Species, it's important to know that... uh, Well, it's important to know that Darwin did not invent evolution, number one. He did not invent evolution. Lots of people during Darwin's day were evolutionists. What he did was uh, argue for, well, he gave it a mechanism that he called natural selection. Just like we have bred animals intentionally in our dog kennels and stuff, he argued nature is breeding animals as well. 
through natural, the select, he, nature's selecting them because of their fitness, the same way we're selecting them in our kennels because we like the way they look. Okay, he's arguing, he gave it a mechanism, natural selection, but he, in doing so, he argued, though, that this process was slow and gradual. Because we've been doing these kind of, this kind of selective breeding for thousands of years. You know, all the way back since biblical times. Even Jacob and it was doing some selective breeding there. Since now, and in all human history, we've never produced anything of significance in all of these breeding histories. We've just made different looking dogs in our dog breeding, or different looking cats in our cat breeding, different looking horses in our horse breeding. We've never, it's never accomplished anything of significance. And so Darwin, arg Darwin argued that this process must be slow and gradual. Slow and gradual, if it is a selective, a natural selection process similar to what we've been doing in our kennels all these years. Okay, but he, uh, at the time he published on the origin of species, he couldn't point to the fossils to demonstrate this at that time. Now they knew a lot about the fossil record then, but he couldn't point to the fossils. And in on, in his book on the origin of species, he actually gives a carefully worded apology that he cannot point to the fossils, but he predicted they would eventually be found. Now, so the, the, the evolutions of Darwin's day held to a view of evolution they call a saltatory evolution. Saltatory evolution. What Darwin argued against the view of his day, arguing that the process must be slow and gradual. The evolution of Darwin's day held to a view called saltation. They believed that evolution occurred in rapid jumps. And the reason why they believe this is because when they looked around at living populations, what they saw were distinct groups, distinct groups. And between these groups, there were no animals. Like there's a whole bunch of lizards, right? And you got a whole bunch of turtles, and yet and these are all rep, but there's, but there's nothing between them. And there's a whole bunch of snakes, but there's nothing between the turtles and the snakes or between the reptiles and the snakes. And so now this, this was very puzzling. That, and, but the, the evolution of Darwin's day argued that evolution must occur in, in rapid jumps because what we see are these distinct groups. Well, of the animals that are in the fossil record, we also see those distinct groups. And so Darwin, who was very puzzled by this, gives a carefully worded apology and argued that the reason why there are distinct groups in living populations is just due to extinctions. So he believed this process was slow and gradual, and that because of the extinctions in living populations, we have distinct groups. But that the transitional forms should be present in the fossil record. In 1837, uh, he, in, uh, this is 20 years before he published his book on the origin of species, he sketched out this little diagram of an evolutionary tree. This is one of his very first notebooks. This is uh, in a museum somewhere, uh, Museum of Natural History, Manhattan. Anyway... I'm going to give you the text on this so you, and, and try to help you understand what he was meaning in this little uh, sketch of his. Up in the upper left, he says, I think. I think, he says, and then below, the case must be that one, that one generation then should have as many living as now. To do this and to have as many species in the same genus requires extinction. I've underlined it. Thus, between A and B, a couple of these groups, there's an immense gap. Of relation, big gap between them. Between C and B, C and uh, B, there's a fine gap or gradation, and between B and D, there's an even greater gra gap between those two. Thus, genera would be formed bearing relations to ancient types with several extinct forms. So he argued the reason why there are distinct groups of living populations was because of extinction, that the animals between your lizards and your turtles had all gone extinct, leaving only behind the living turtles and your living reptiles. This was his. This was his argument. Okay, so now for 150 years, we've been looking for all of those transitional forms. We've been looking for all those transitional forms that Darwin believed had gone extinct in the fossil record. 150 years now after Darwin published On the Origin of Species, 150 years after he gave his carefully worded apology that he could not point to the fossils at that time to prove his theory, that instead of evolution being saltatory in a jumping mo mode like this, leaving no transitional forms, it in fact had lived transitional forms, they just all went extinct. Okay. Well, James W. Valentine is an evolutionary biologist at California University, and he makes this confession in his book, What Darwin Began. He says, the fossil record is of little use in providing direct evidence of the pathways of descent of the phyla or of the invertebrate classes. Well, the, I've given you examples of invertebrate phyla on the bottom of this slide. 
Invertebrate phyla are animals like the, the cnidarians, the jellyfish and sea anemones, all those are cnidarians. The echinoderms, represented by your starfish, your sea urchins, your, all those. And then your clams are your mollusks, your uh, cephalopods and gastropods are also in there. And then your arthropods, like your uh, tritobite over there. So these are represented phyla. Valentine is saying here that fossil record is of little use in providing evidence of the pathways of descent of phyla, which are these big groups, but also of the classes, the invertebrate classes, which are the groups that make up them. Okay, He's, let me he continues. Each phyla with a fossil record had already evolved its characteristic body plan when it first appeared, so far as we can tell from the fossil remains, and no phyla is connected to any other via intermediate fossil types. Indeed, none of the invertebrate classes can be connected together with another class by a series of intermediates. Fact is, the invertebrate phyla are about as different from one another as animals can possibly be. It's, God seemed to love doing that, to make these things that are just so bizarre and so different, and that's what these phyla are. They're as different from one another as animals can possibly be. And, but if Darwin was true, instead of there being distinct forms like these phyla, there should be an imperceptible blend. The organism should just blend from one form into another form into another form. There should be no distinctions between them. There should be no gaps between them. What Valentine is saying here is not only are there, is there huge gaps through which we cannot connect the phylum together, like the cnidarians and your kinoderms, we cannot even connect the classes together that make up those phylums. So in the cnidarians, which is like the jellyfish there, also the sea anemones and coral. He said, we can't even connect the classes together. We can't even connect your sea anemones to the coral and hydra together by way of fossil forms, much less can we connect the phyla together. They're as different from one another as they can possibly be. And when they first appear in the fossil record, they're perfect. The first time a, a jellyfish appears in the fossil record, it's a perfect jellyfish. The first time a, a starfish appears in the fossil record, it's a perfect starfish. There's nothing in the fossil record that shows what evolved into the cnidarians, what evolved into the kinoderms, what evolved into the mollusk, or what evolved into arthropods. The first time they appear in the fossil record, they appear out of nowhere. They just suddenly appear in the fossil record. Where's the evolution? And what about the evolution of the first invertebrate? Vertebra some one of these invertebrates must have evolved in the first uh, vertebrate, but there is simply no evolution demonstrated by way of the fossil record for either the invertebrate phyla, like those you see here. Well, again, and we're talking about highly specialized organisms. Aquatic animals are highly specialized for aquatic environments. Flying animals are highly specialized flying forms. But the first time we find those in the fossil record, they're perfect. Highly specialized aquatic form, the first time we see them. Highly specialized flying forms, first time we see them, like the bats or your pterosaurs. Your bird. First time a bat appears in the fossil record, perfect bat. First time we find a pterosaur, like a pterodactyl in the fossil record, perfect pterosaur. There's no evolutionary history for any of those animals. Well, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, shown here, was perhaps one of the most popular evolutionists of our day, or our paleontologist, a fossil guy, right? I say this because uh, um, he was uh, featured on an episode of The Simpsons, you know, so to be a famous scientist today, you got to make your way into, uh, you know, in a, in a cartoon series, or, you know, you're just not making it there. Well, he says this. Now, this... Uh, 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 arguably one of the famous paleontologists, fossil guy of our, of our generation, says this. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data, data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. Stephen Jay Gould, one of the most popular or famous evolutionists, paleontologists of our day, says lack of transitional forms is a trade secret of paleontology. Everyone knows it. Well, in an attempt to explain away this mystery, the absence of transitional forms, Stephen Jay Gould and this guy, Niles Eldridge, proposed a new theory to account for the absence of transitional forms, a theory they called Punctuated equilibrium. It's shown there down the bottom. Punctuated equilibrium. They propose this new theory. They argued that once uh, an organism had adapted, it uh, would, be, would reach a point of equilibrium with its environment and remain unchanged for a long time period. 
So it would remain unchanged and leave fossil forms then when, it, when it's unchanged. But then if the Earth's environment rapidly changed, changes, like from a desert to an you know, ocean environment or something, then, then there would have to be rapid evolution take place, and this is the punctuated part. So they say animals will remain unchanged for a long period of time, and then due to some demand like a, a sudden cha change in, the earth, in environment, then the organism would have to evolve suddenly, punctuated, and then equilibrium, punctuated and equilibrium. But punctuated equilibrium, when you get right down to it, is just saltation by another name. The evolution of the Darwin's day argued for saltatory or jumping evolution. And in fact, Darwin say, said, uh, non tur non facet saltum. He said in one of his famous phrases, nature takes no sudden leaps. He said it was slow and gradual. The same selective process that's been taking place in our populations of cows and horses and stuff for, throughout human history is the same thing that's happening in nature. And it's a slow, very, very slow and very gradual process. Because again, we've never produced anything of significance. In all of our breeding histories, nothing has been accomplished. Just different kinds of old dogs and our dog breeding different kinds of cats. So he said slow and gradual, slow and gradual over long periods of time. The, the transitional forms, he argued, are in the fossil record. They're, they're not present in living populations because, because of extinction. They will be found in the fossil record. But 150 years later, paleontologists have been scouring the globe trying to find these fossils, and they have come up empty. So empty, in fact, that paleontologists like Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge have proposed what the evolution of Darwin's day had argued for. That evolution must occur so rapidly that it doesn't leave fossil forms. Niles Eldridge. He, Darwin, pro prophesied that future generations of paleontologists would fill in these gaps by diligent search, the gaps in the fossil record, right? 120 years of paleontological research later, it has become abundantly clear that the fossil record will not confirm this part of Darwin's predictions, nor is the problem a miserably poor record. The fossil record simply shows that this prediction was wrong. Hmm, what's wrong? The slow and gradual process that Darwin envisioned should have left abundant fossils. But the evolutionary tree of life that is so often shown without disclaimer is simply without fossil support. It's mostly inference, however reasonable, as Stephen Jay Gould said, not the, not the due to fossils. Instead, what we find in the fossil record are the same distinct groups that we find in living populations. Despite an enormity of effort, the primitive ancestors of the various phyla have not been found in the fossil record, nor can evolutionists connect the phyla to each other by fossil forms. There are other, other problems with the evolutionist interpretation of the fossil record, like the out-of-place fossils. So again, remember that the geologic order of fossils described by paleontologists, like you see in this diagram, this order that you see here, is not really set in stone. Again, they often find fossils out of place, often by millions of years, but they can explain most of these away. They can explain many out-of-place fossils away by arguing for, what they, for a secondary erosion event. Meaning, if I had a bed of fossils like the one on the slide right here, and that bed of fossils started ro it, it was exposed to some erosion and started eroding away from the top, what would first erode away are the fossils on the top, and they would be deposited. Then what would be eroded next would be the fossils beneath them. They would be deposited on the top. And the ones below them would be deposited on the top. So you can completely invert a fossil sequence through a secondary erosion event and depositional event. Okay? So they can explain away most, they explain away most out of place fossils arguing for secondary uh, events like that, but you can't explain away all of them like that. And I'll show you a few. So understand that their interpretation of fossils works this way. The first time an animal appears in the fossil record, is to them, uh, they believe, to be the time when it first evolved. The last time an animal appears in the fossil record, understand, is the time they believe when it went extinct. Okay? But we find lots of problems with this. For example, uh, if, you'll, if you'll look about halfway down this diagram, you see a weird-looking fish. I'm going to try to point to it. Right? That one right there is a, a, a fish they call a, we, we call it sarcopterygii, or it's the coelacanth. So there's most fish that you know of are, are ray fin fishes, what they call actinopterygii, class actinopterygii. There are a few that are what we call lobe fin fishes, are sarcopterygii. And this is the main member right here, called a coelacanth. Well, it was thought to have gone extinct 70 million years ago. Uh, but then, suddenly, it was discovered in, in 1938. A fisherman brought one, brought one to shore. 
And someone looked at this thing and was like, man, I've never seen a fish like that. We better take it to an expert. Took it to an expert. They took a look at it and like, well, they were, that was a fossil form. They thought that was, they thought that was extinct. It was some, a fossilized animal that they recognize now still living. Well, they now know where these live. And they've caught like 200 of these things. They live deep in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Madagascar. Okay? But what is kind of most interesting about this is this was one of their favorite transitional forms. It has these fat, fleshy fins. And they argued, oh, those fat, fleshy fins were probably used to crawl up on land, and it evolved and became the first amphibian. Okay? Well, the reason why we didn't know they were alive is because they don't live on the continental shelf. A nice the place where they would have crawled up, and, uh, crawled up on land, right? They lived deep in the Indian Ocean, which is why we didn't know they were alive today. So not a transitional form, doesn't live in the right place to be a transitional form, and is still alive today, arguing against its, their, their interpretation of fossils. Because again, the last time they appear in the fossil record is like 70 million years ago, according to their interpretation. The Willumi pine shown here was discovered in 1994 in the Blue Mountains near Sydney, Australia after thought to have been extinct 150 million years. You can buy them now online. You can go online, buy your Willamie pine, and stick you, have you a fossil, uh, you know, a living fossil there in your, in your front yard. The ginkgo was similar. The, like ginkgo biloba, if you ever take, if we have any vitamin uh, people. The ginkgo was thought to have gone extinct 270 million years ago until it was discovered in, a, in, a, in like a garden in Japan. Or it was found as like one of the, the uh, palace gardens of Japan or something. In 1996, uh, the Loatian rock rat, shown here, was discovered being sold as meat in a meat market in Laos. But, uh, you know, thought to, it was thought to have been extinct for 11 million years, found being sold for meat in a meat market in Laos. But don't criticize, you know, don't criticize, because a little sriracha, you know, probably uh, couldn't tell any different than chicken. I'm just thinking. In 2005, a mammal, shown here, was found with a dinosaur in its stomach. Now, you have to really be an expert on dinosaur uh, anatomy to know that that's the contents, that contents of the stomach is a dinosaur, but that's what they say it is. But the reason why this was a really, really shocking discovery of, in the, of its day was because when this was discovered, they thought mammals of this size did not live at the time of the dinosaurs. They're so sure about their interpretation of this fossil sorting that you literally have to find one in the belly of another to prove them they're wrong, prove to them that they're wrong. Uh, in, out of place fossils doesn't do it because they, oh, what was the secondary erosion event? You have to find one in the belly of another. Well, another major problem with the uh, secular interpretation of fossils is the enormity of living fossils that are found. Now, a living fossil is a name for an organism found in the fossil record, but is represented by living species today that are virtually identical to their fossilized ancestors. And the list that I gave you here I created for you here are animals that all date more than 100 million years. And, and this really, when you get right down to it, this is for the vast majority of fossils. And the reason why this is such a big problem is because of their interpretation of the fossil record, which remember is that the different layers form during different depositional environments. They believe the environments of the earth change dramatically. Let me go back just to make sure you remember this uh, picture of the Grand Canyon over here. The different colored layers, they believe, form during different environments. That the Earth's environment changed dramatically over time. It went from an ocean to a swamp to a desert and had different sediments forming in those environments. Well, if the Earth was changing so dramatically through time, then why is it that we find so many living, living fossils? An enormous number of living fossils have been discovered. Let me go uh, show you a few of these. The uh, stingray uh, are, date back 50 million years date back to 50 million years ago, but they're identical to the stingrays we find alive today. Squids are dated to 160 million years ago, and they're identical to squids we have alive today. Lobsters date back 200 million years. They're the same. Cockroaches date back 250 million years. We would wish they didn't survive, maybe, but shield bugs, or what we call stink bugs, are, are date back 50 million years. It's still exactly the same as the, as the shield bugs we find alive today. Frogs are the same as the frogs we have alive today. Bats are the same. And again, I mentioned them before, bats, these highly specialized creatures like the bat, first time they appear in the fossil record, it's a perfect bat. Perfect bat. And this is a flying creature with a number of highly specialized uh, you know, morphologies that enable it to fly like this. First, first time they appear in the fossil record, perfectly formed bat. Lizards are the same. Centipedes are the same. Spiders are the same. Flying ants are the same. I can go on and on. 
Uh, snakes and turtles are exactly the same. And both of these also cause particular problems for paleontologists because the carapace, the shell on the turtle in particular, is very, very hard. Not the kind of thing uh, that would slip through mineralization. If there had been those animals in the fossil record, they should have been. We should find mineralized turtle shells, but we don't. The first time they appear in the fossil record, per perfectly formed, perfectly formed uh, 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 specimens, the first time they appear. Um, we don't see an evolution of them. The first time they appear, it's a perfectly formed turtle. And the same way with the snake. Uh, uh, the the ex extensions of the vertebrae, are, are those kind of bones are very, very dense, fossilized very well. We should be, have been able to find the evolution of the snake if it indeed had happened. Crickets, scorpions, flies, all the same. We could go on and on. The fossil record In reality, it, if we made it today, would basically have the same animals. The, the animals that are in the fossil record are basically the same animals that we find alive today. And the first time they appear in the fossil record, they're perfectly formed. There's just no evidence for evolution coming from the fossil record. But perhaps the biggest challenge for the secular interpretation of the fossil record is what is called the Cambrian Explosion. Now, what, is, what this is, it is the, the name given to a sudden appearance of life on earth. An appearance of life on earth that is so sudden, they call it an explosion of life. This Time magazine cover called it evolution's big bang. The description on the cover reads this. New discoveries show that life as we know it began in an amazing Biological frenzy that changed the planet almost overnight. Well, what it was, was an, an ex sudden explosion of life in the geologic period we call the Cambrian. That's why they call it the Cambrian explosion. Before the Cambrian, all we find is bacteria. And man, we find bacteria deep too. Uh, all the way back now to like 3.9 billion years. They keep pushing back the origin of life further and further and further, because the deeper we go, the deeper we go, the, we keep finding bacteria. It's because life has always been here. It didn't evolve. It's always been here. But down the Cambrian, suddenly, boom, in this one layer we call the Cambrian, beneath this, just bacteria. Then this one layer, boom, suddenly the vast majority of the invertebrate phyla appear out of nowhere. They just suddenly explode onto the scene, pop into existence out of nowhere. No indication of what evolved into them. They just suddenly appear out of nowhere. And even according to Stephen Jay Gould, the Cambrian explosion distressed Darwin tremendously. And that's according to Stephen Jay Gould. Darwin himself was deeply puzzled by the Cambrian explosion. He called it an inexplicable mystery, an inexplicable mystery, Darwin. In his book on the origin of species, he said this, there is another, he was talking about problems, and there's another and an, another and an allied difficulty, which is even much more serious. I allude to the manner in which many species in several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom suddenly appear in the lowest known fossiliferous rocks. To the question, why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belong, belonging to these earliest periods, I can give no satisfactory answer. Where are the organisms that evolved into these animals in the Cambrian? They just suddenly appear out of nowhere. Well, Darwin's imagined tree of life is just that. It was just imagination. It is not supported by fossils. Rather, what the fossil record shows is a sudden appearance of life on Earth and then a slow and gradual accumulation of organisms after that uh, as new species develop, not new kinds. God created many organisms, as it says, after the kinds, which diversified into uh, just different species, not different kinds. We've never seen that. We've never seen that. So let's revisit the question we asked at the beginning. Which interpretation does the evidence best support? Does it support the evolutionary view? Have fossils uh, show up, evolved over long periods of time, or were buried in watery sediments gradually? Or is the biblical view much more clearly demonstrated there that fossils appeared suddenly and were buried rapidly in watery sediments during Noah's flood. Well, let's, let's summarize the case again. Does, uh, do fossils support evolution? No. The sudden appearance of life in the Cambrian explosion it argues strongly against this. The absence of transitional forms does not demonstrate evolution. The abundance of living organisms 
and that out-of-place fossils show, uh, show that, uh, that life on Earth has not changed over time. They argue that the Earth's environment has changed dramatically, but animals are still the same. They're still the same as the ones we have today. What about the biblical view? Is it supported? Do fossils support the biblical view? Yes. The lateral continuity of, of, of fossils. I didn't, I didn't talk about the laws of stratigraphy, but remember, these beds of rocks that fossils are found in extend for hundreds and in some cases thousands of miles. So significant is this characteristic of the fossil record that it is a law of stratigraphy called the law of lateral continuity. These beds are laterally continuous or horizontally indefinite. They extend forever until they're truncated by either a, a, geographic, a, a barrier like a mountain range or taper off the continental shelf. They extend forever. It's one of the laws of strat stratigraphy. What about the, those, uh, the abundance of ocean fossils? Argue strongly for a, a massive flood where the oceans inundated the continents. We find highly preserved fossils showing they must have been buried rapidly catastrophically to uh, prevent decomposition and allowing fossilization to take place. And we found those mass fossil graveyards that speak again to the catastrophic nature of those fossilized beds. Well, the fossiliferous strata does make it up a record. It is a record, but not of life on earth over hundreds of millions of years. Despite the abundance of evidence to support the event, where you side on this debate may ultimately be determined by where you place your authority of truth, with man's fallibility or with God's sovereign word. The fossil record is a record, but it's not a record of life on earth. It's a record of that terrible global flood. When the fossil record is interpreted correctly, it is clear. It is a clear and monumental testimony to that terrible flood described in the Bible. The sorting of fossils merely represents the destruction of those successive life zones or biomes, by the rising waters in the global flood. Well, when the fossil record is correctly understood as being the result of the global flood, it is easy to see that there is no evidence that the earth is older than the biblical account because it is the fossil record from which they get their ancient age of the earth. When the fossil record is correctly interpreted, their evidence for the ancient, this ancient age just vanishes. And there are, in fact, hundreds of natural processes that can be, can be used to determine the upper limit of the age of creation. And many of these conflict with the idea that the universe or the earth is billions of years old and show maximum possible ages much less than those that are required by evolution. Evolutionists tout radiometric dating as this absolute age dating indicator. But there are lots and lots and lots of age dating indicators that can be used to show that the earth is simply not millions of years old. Ladies and gentlemen, there was a global flood, and the fossil record is a monumental body of evidence for this event. Interpreting these rocks otherwise, though, has been devastating. What the uh, devastating consequences of these ideas there have been. Because of what, what these rocks were always meant to mean. See, I mean, we know why God sent the flood, to just because of the wickedness that was on the earth in those days. But there are, there are other times in Scripture where he judges people for their behavior, for their wickedness, but didn't do it with a flood. Frequently, he did it with plagues, right? There were several times when he used plagues to uh, judge peoples. Why didn't he use a plague in this case? Well, if he used, had used a plague, who would know? Where would the evidence be other than the text that it had ever occurred? I believe he destroyed the world by flood because he wanted to leave a memorial. We need memorials. We need to remember events. Whenever there's a big war, we build memorials to remind us of that terrible war. Or when people build, built things of monumental types, they, they put up stelas. Like the pyramids in Egypt, they would put up a stela saying who built this monument. We need memorials because they're important. Well, God knew that we needed a memorial about this event too. A memorial to remind us just how much God hates sin. Because, see, we forget. And this is one thing we forgot. Or the modern church has helped us forget. Because the modern church doesn't talk about God's judgment much. We do here at Cedar Park. Pastor Jay's good about talking about sin and judgment. But in a lot of churches today, you don't hear, God talking about, hear the pastor talking about God's judgment. We've kind of changed the nature of God. We talk a lot about his love. We don't talk about his hatred of sin and his judgment 
His saints are not just sin, but the sinner. Understand, he didn't kill the sin back in the days of Noah. He killed the sinners in the days of Noah. It's not just sin that he hates. He hates the sinner. And I would argue that he hates more, sin more today than he did back in Noah's day. That he hates the sinner more today than he did back in Noah's day because we're living in an age following his son coming and dying to pay the penalties for our sins. Now, who do you think God would hate sin in more, in their life more? Someone back in Noah's day or someone today who knows that his son died for me, for my sin, and then I continue to sin? In whose life does God, do you think God hates sin more? Someone back in Noah's day or someone that lives today knowing that his son died to pay the penalties for our sin and we continue to sin? God hates sin. And we should never forget that terrible day because that is a good reminder of just how much God hates sin. And the God that hates sin that much, we will stand before one day. The right of Hebrews says it's a terrifying thing to be in the hand of the Almighty God. And one day we'll be standing there in the hand of the Almighty God, giving an account for every bad thing we said, every evil thought in our heart. That's going to be a long day for me. That's going to be a long day. A long millennia as I talked through all of those things. <clears throat> and Jesus reminded us that the latter judgment will come much as it did in the days of Noah. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. But just as God provided Noah a way to be saved from the coming judgment, so he's provided us a way to through his son, Jesus Christ. All he asks is that we repent. He does ask something of us. It's not just enough. Please hear me here. It's not, if you said, if you said a prayer a long time ago, back when you were a kid and asked Jesus in your heart, that does not save you. That thing alone does not save you. You must repent. It's what the prophets preach. It's what John the Baptist preached, and it's what Jesus preached. It's, what the, it's the central gospel message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. If you have sin in your life, you must not just confess that sin to God, but repent. Promise to him that you will put that sin out of your life. You will stop doing that sin. Make that promise to him. Renew your relationship with him. Because if you have sin in your life, he has separated himself from you, not hearing your prayers. You have to repent. If you have sin in your life now, you have to repent. If you need help repenting, ask the Holy Spirit. Because that's one of the helps that he brings. He brings wisdom, brings insight. He brings conviction, though. No. If there's sin in your life, sin that's been there a long time, sin that you struggle with, and you want, to, and want healing from that, you want recovering from that, ask, 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 pray and ask the Holy Spirit for conviction. Because if it's a sin that you've been dealing with for a while, it may take powerful conviction. Conviction that leads to tears may be necessary to stop a sin that you've been dealing with for a long time. Pray for it. The Holy Spirit will give you that, will help you with that. That's one of the things that the Holy Spirit brings. Pray for it. He will help. I... Uh, I realized much late now that I never put up my lecture notes at the beginning of the lecture. Um, so, Eric, forgive me for this. For one, I'm going to put these up very briefly, just maybe so the people that are uh, watching them online have a little bit of a chance to do this. But there's my lecture notes there. If someone wanted to get a copy of the lecture notes, all you have to do is point to the cell phone and grab the lecture notes there. I used to do that at the beginning. I'm going to do another one of a quiz. So, let me go back to the end before I close out my prayer. And I'm going to show, up, show another QR code for the quiz. Those are the lecture notes. You can, it'll download a PDF with, uh, with all the slides and, and what I say. You can also download my PowerPoints. I make all my PowerPoints freely available. They're all, they're all, all the lecture notes are there. Here's the quiz. If you want to take the quiz, a uh, simple quiz. I use these in my classes here at Cedar Park Christian Schools. Quick quiz to check your understanding and uh, see if you missed anything. I expect A's. I expect 95's or better on these. Anyway, send me an email if you, if you had trouble, struggles with something or if I misspoke on anything, please. Let me close out in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for 
today, Lord, for the opportunity that I had to be able to come and share, the opportunity that we here at Cedar Park have had, had the teachers here have had in our classrooms today. Father God, we're so thankful for Cedar Park, for Cedar Park Church, for Cedar Park Christian Schools, for this tremendous ministry and all the, the teachings that it provides. And Father, we, uh, we thank you for Cedar Park and we ask you to bless that ministry. Cedar Park Church and Cedar Park Christian Schools, Father, both the campus here and the campus where I teach over in Linwood, Father, that we, we would ask that you help parents come to recognize the dangerous place where they have their children in these public schools, Father, that you would convict them. Father God, I ask today for conviction of any parent that has their, their child in a public school today, that they would, you would convict them over that decision that they have made, and Father God, that you would bring the help to direct them to information about Cedar Park or some other Christian school in the area, Father God. We ask, we ask you to help these, uh, these parents and these, these young people, Father. Help them find their way to some good biblical teachings, Father, like, like we provide here, Father. Father God, we thank you, Father, for, uh, for your word. We thank you for the word, Father God, and, and the tremendous insight that has brought us. Because, Father, we would truly be lost without your word, having only the teachings of man to rely upon as our source of truth. But instead, Father, we have your word that has given us uh, such wisdom into the history of this world. Such insight, Father God, we truly are blessed to have it. Father God, we ask you to help us understand it, Lord. We ask for wisdom through your Holy Spirit to help us understand your word, the tremendous teachings that are there, the many layers that are contained within it, the cultural, uh, the, the expressions, the idioms, the, the, the traditions from the culture of that period. Father, we need help to understand your word, Lord. We ask for wisdom to help us understand your word. And we ask for wisdom to help us understand the science that's being taught today all the scientific findings that are being used today to argue against your word, the history that's contained within. Help us, Lord. We, we need wisdom. Father, we, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for insight that you've given us through your word and through your Holy Spirit. Father, we praise you, Lord, and we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your insight, and we thank you for your son, Yeshua, who you sent to die to pay the penalties for my sin. Lord, we're sorry. So sorry that it was my sin that it was our sin that made it necessary for your son to die for me. And Father God, I ask again tonight for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, forgive us tonight. We ask for forgiveness of sins in the name of your son, Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ. We ask tonight for forgiveness of sins. Forgive us, Lord, of the sins that are in our life, Father. We confess those to you now, Father God, and we ask for help with repentance. Help us, for Father, if there's sin in our life, examine us tonight, we ask. And if there's any sin in our life, Father, we ask for conviction, uh, conviction that will help lead to repentance, Father God. Father, we want to live righteously before you. We want our life to glorify and honor you. Father God, help us, Lord, to live righteously before you so our life will be a witness, a testimony of your creation and your love. Father God, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify and honor you. Praise you, Lord God. Be with us tonight, Father God. Help us to remember what we've learned and help us to be bold in our witness, we ask. In Jesus' name, we ask all things. Amen.